Okay, so <clears throat> until now, while doing costing, simple costing or activity-based costing, we have uh, we've actually been making a very very big assumption about the amount of capacity you have and the amount of capacity you use. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. So suppose <clears throat> you have a factory. Let's go back to plastic. Okay, they made the simple lenses and the complex lenses. Those are two products, A and B. So suppose you have a factory that's capable of making, uh, let's say, a total of 100,000 lenses. Okay? So the capacity of that facility is 100,000 lenses. But let's say that right now, in the short term or in the medium term, your total demand for both types of lenses only equals 80,000, okay? So you have a facility that has the capacity to make 100,000 lenses. <coughs> Let's draw that. 100,000 lenses. But let's suppose that your total demand for both types of lenses, 100,000 lenses in total. But let's suppose that your total demand for both types of lenses, so I'll change it up a little bit, equals only 60,000 lenses. Okay? So that's what you're using. 60,000 lenses. You're using really 60% of your total available capacity, yes? And the remaining 40% of your capacity is doing what? What is the remaining 40% of your capacity doing? Hmm? It's idle. It's not doing anything. Right? It's such a pure cost. It's not generating any revenue. Okay? So you have 60% of your capacity is used. And the remaining 40% of your capacity is idle. So this is what it means to have idle capacity. Okay, so idle basically means um, right now it's not being used for anything. Now let's look at the 60% of the capacity that is currently being used. And let us suppose you have these two products, A and B. Okay, and let's suppose that the 60% is being used up by A and B in a 1 is to 5 proportion. Okay, let's suppose that A is using up 10% of the total and B is using up 50% of the total. So everyone understands the facts, right? So the capacity that is being used is being used in a 1 is to 5 proportion. Okay, so now what we want to do is the same, same thing as we've been doing before. We want to estimate the total the cost per unit of one widget A and the cost per unit of one widget B. Okay? So the question that I want you to think about is <clears throat> suppose you're trying to allocate rent. Rent is one of the costs of capacity. One of the costs of fixed capacity, right? Is anytime you acquire some fixed capacity that necessarily means a fixed amount of space and you have to pay a certain fixed rent on that. How much of the total rent do you, you know that you have to split up the rent in a one is to five proportion, you know that, right? The question is, how much of the rent do you split up and distribute across A and B? Do you distribute 100% of the rent, or do you only distribute 60% of the rent? In other words, the rent on that portion of the capacity that you're actually using. Does everyone understand the question? Do you distribute the whole rent, or do you only distribute across A and B the rent that's on the, on, the, on the proportion of capacity that's actually being used? Or in other words, what, what is the overhead amount that is relevant that you need to use in order to allocate? Do you use the overheads on the entire capacity that you have, or do you use the overheads only on the capacity that you actually use in a given period? Which of the two makes more sense and why? So that's one argument, right? So we would have to distribute the entire rent because regardless of whether that rent is being used, or that, that rent is being paid 
you know, productive sense or not, it's still an expense in this period. So at the end of the day, we have to include it in our cost per unit because we have to set a price that covers that, covers that cost. Right? Is there anyone who believes differently? Is there anyone who believes that we should only distribute across A and B the cost of the capacity that we actually use as opposed to the capacity that we own or have? <coughs> Is no one who believes differently? This is a very unanimous class. Is there anyone who believes that it, that, that would create a problem? Okay, so here's, okay, let me, let me rephrase the question. Suppose we were to distribute the cost of the entire, the entire rent across A and B. Think about what the economic consequences of that would be. First on your price, and then on your market share. So another way to think about it is you're going to be pricing at something slightly higher than your what your equilibrium price should be. And what we mean by an equilibrium state is a state in which everything is being organized optimally, right? Because think about when you might have idle capacity. In the long run, should you have any idle capacity? You shouldn't. You, you all intuitively sense that, right? In the long run, you shouldn't have any idle capacity because if you keep having idle capacity in the long run, what that means is you're simply doing something wrong. Right? You're not organizing your factors of production in an optimal sense. Now, when is, it, when is it acceptable to have idle capacity? It's acceptable to have some idle capacity in the short run. Right? Because you go out and you sign a lease on a factory that allows you to produce, let's say, 100,000 widgets, and you're tied into that lease, let's say, for a year. And let's just, and so let's suppose those two products are kind of new products that you're trying to get out to market. And let's just imagine that the demand doesn't quite grow at the same rate at which we expect it to grow. So until the end of the year, you're going to be stuck at producing at 80% capacity, you're going to be stuck with some idle capacity. Right? Um, so in the short run, it's perfectly common and it's also acceptable to have idle capacity. But hopefully, what should happen after that one year? I, one of two things should happen. Either your demand should grow to meet that capacity, or if you realize that your demand is not going to grow to meet that capacity, what response should you take? You should downsize a little bit. Right? So in the long run, having idle capacity is not an equilibrium outcome. It means that you are not matching your uh, resources to your opportunities in an optimal sense. So idle capacity is only something that you ever have in the short run. So if you price in such a way that you incorporate the cost of your entire capacity into the cost per unit of each of your products, in the short run what's going to happen is that you are going to end up charging a price that's higher than what? <clears throat> You're going to end up charging a price that's, first of all, as we heard, higher than the price that a competitor might charge if he didn't have any idle capacity. Right? But what's more important to recognize is always what are you trying to achieve by costing? What does that unit cost represent? That unit cost should represent the value of all the resources that you use in making the product. Because a rational and informed consumer, ideally, should not be willing to pay you a penny more than the value of the resources that you use in making the product. Right? So the question you want to ask yourself is, is this a resource that's used in making the product? Is it a resource that's used in making the product? Yes or no? Clearly not, right? It's just a resource that we happen to have, that we happen to have acquired and that we're stuck with in the short term, but it's not a resource that we use in making the product. This is the resource that we use in making the product. And ideally, your unit cost, the unit cost that you use as an input into your pricing decisions should only represent the value of all the resources that you use in making the product and nothing else because everything else is extraneous noise. It's going to result in some overpricing or underpricing. Okay? So now you might ask the question like, okay, suppose we don't include this cost in our unit cost estimate. Where does this cost go? Like, you have to include it somewhere, right? Because this is your argument, Eric. Regardless of whether you use it or not, it still is an expense. And you still need to 
consider the fact that you have this additional expense in your pricing strategy or your marketing strategy or whatever. So where does it even show up, for example, on the financial statements, right? So I want to pull up something from chapter two, where we talked about cost classification that we didn't talk about then because it wasn't relevant, but which we're going to need to refer to now. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you don't have your chapter two outlines, and we'll pull it up. <clears throat> so this is a picture of a standard income statement. Is it large enough for everyone to see? Okay, this is a picture of a standard income statement, and I want you to look at it for a moment. There's two really blocks of information here. There is your sales revenue on top, and then there is your cost of goods sold. Okay? And your sales revenue minus your cost of goods sold. So that's 210 minus 108 gives you 102,000, and that is called your gross margin or your gross profit. Now, after your gross margin, you deduct now, a bunch of other costs, R&D, design, marketing, distribution, and customer service costs. That's an extra 70000 That leaves you with the final operating income of 32000 And you're familiar with this format. You've seen many income statements before in financial, right? This is what all income statements look like. Now, let me ask you a question. Why are the costs broken out and presented separately in two places? So the costs are deducted in two steps, right? They're not deducted in a single step. Because first you deduct cost of goods sold. And then after you finish deducting cost of goods sold, you deduct some other costs. So why are the costs being deducted in two different steps? There's obviously something that's distinguishing these two costs, right? Has anyone, has anyone talk, or did you talk about it in financial? <clears throat> everyone understands the question, right? Why are the costs being deducted in two steps instead of being deducted in a single step? <laughs> yeah? You're absolutely right. That's part, that, that's part of the distinction, but that's not the whole distinction. You're absolutely right. Yes. Is there any other ideas on why, on what is it that's distinguishing those two costs? What separates really cost of goods sold from all those other costs, R&D, design, marketing, etc.? I'm sure you've thought about this because you've seen financial statements that look exactly like this in financial accounting tens of times. Hasn't there? Um, what do you mean by a long-term cost as opposed to a current cost? Yes, but keep in mind that this is not the balance sheet. This is the income statement. And so by definition, any expense that shows up on the income statement is an expense that was incurred when? In the current period. So, I mean, there's no such thing as a current expense and a long-term expense. Okay, but keep thinking along those lines. Um, it's a good answer but it's incomplete in the following sense. <clears throat> this is the income statement for the entire enterprise. For the entire enterprise. So this is not an allocated number. It is 100% of, of this, is not, this is not a divisional. I should have made that clear. This is not the income statement by division or by product. Right? This is just an overall entity level income statement. But you're kind of, you're kind of a little bit worse. Yeah, one more answer. Okay. Okay. I'm going to tell you guys what the difference is. There are a number of differences, okay? <clears throat> but whatever costs are included in cost of goods sold, <clears throat> so sorry, but you have to listen to my voice for now. Um, so all the costs that are included in cost of goods sold, uh, what we refer to as product costs. 
Okay, now I'm just telling you the terminology. We'll talk about what that terminology means. And all the costs that are deducted after cost of goods sold separately are referred to as <coughs> are referred to as period costs. Okay? So another term for product cost is inventoriable. Costs. Okay, so now this is just terminology. What does this terminology mean? Anything, the cost of goods sold is computed in the following way. Here's how the accountant actually builds it up. He takes from you, and you are the managerial accountant, remember. He takes from you your estimates of the unit cost, okay, of widget A and widget B and every other type of product that you might have sold and multiplies that unit cost by the number of each item that was sold, and that's how he estimates the cost of goods sold. Okay? So the cost of goods sold <coughs> represents the cost per unit of anything that was sold, and it's only expensed on the income statement in the period in which the product is sold. All the other costs, okay, here, and you can sort of get a hint of, of of what they are by the term period costs, are costs that are naturally, you know, now not included in the in the unit cost, right, that the managerial accountant comes up with because they're deducted separately. All of those costs are always expensed, not in the period in which the product is sold, but in the period in which the costs themselves are incurred. Okay? So that's why the, the distinction product and period. But what determines what goes into a product cost and what goes into a period cost? It's a very simple distinction. It's a distinction that's enforced by FASB mandates. So this is an accounting rule, okay? It's not a, a logical, it's not a fundamental or logical distinction. Any cost that's directly incurred in manufacturing, in the manufacturing process or the production process has got to be included in your cost of goods sold. Okay? Remember the value chain? R&D, design, manufacturing, marketing, distribution, customer service, etc. Any cost that's directly incurred in the process of manufacturing the product is included in your cost of goods, has got to be included in your cost of goods sold. Any cost that relates to any other part of the value chain other than manufacturing, any cost that's not directly incurred as part of the manufacturing process cannot be included in the cost of goods sold. It has got to be deducted separately in the period in which the cost is incurred, or it has to be deducted as a period cost. Okay? So now this distinction is sort of an FASB imposed distinction. Now how does it matter to us? Now, there are two things that I want you to take away. The first thing is you remember that <coughs> the value chain, R&D, design, production, marketing, distribution, and customer service. Anything that comes out of this part of the value chain is going to be included in your COGS. Anything that comes out of any other part of the value chain is going to be excluded from COGS and is going to be deducted as the period cost. The second thing that I want you to remember from this, even within your production cost, is going to be a distinction now. Remember, your cost of goods sold should only include the costs that are directly incurred in the process of manufacturing the product. So the question is, does that include the costs of any ID capacity you may have? So remember the definition. The COGS should include all the costs that are directly incurred in the process of manufacturing the product. So suppose you have some idle capacity in your factory. The cost of that idle capacity, do you think it's going to be included in COGS or not? Because it's not directly incurred in the process of manufacturing the product. Okay? So let's take up some extensions of that. Um, <clears throat> suppose you bought some material okay, uh, to make uh, textile, to make clothing with, and you realize that some part of the material was defective. You decided to throw it away. That's still an expense, right? Because you still have to pay for that material. You have to write off the cost of the material that you didn't use. The cost of that material that you wasted or threw away or which spoiled, will it be included in COGS or not? 
it's not going to be included in COX because again it wasn't directly incurred in the process of manufacturing. Okay, so this is a, a very very important distinction, but it's one that sort of that sort of escapes most people. So the takeaway for us is that any cost of idle capacity, spoilage, wastage, scrap, etc., all of that we have no business including those costs in our unit cost estimates that we come up with as managerial accountants because the objective of that unit cost estimate is to capture the value of all the resources that were poured into making the product. Okay, assuming an optimal and ideal manufacturing process always, of course, because if you're going to price based on that unit cost estimate, if your unit cost estimate includes the cost of your inefficiencies, then what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up building the cost of those inefficiencies into the price that you charge the customer, and that's simply not a feasible pricing strategy if you have some competition in the market. Okay, um, <coughs> so. Um, now that we're on the topic, let me throw a question out to you. Does it matter whether we classify something as a product cost or a period cost as far as overall income, operating income is concerned? Because operating income is always after deducting both types of costs, right? So whether you classify something as a product or as a period cost should be relevant to operating income, yes? So why is it such a big deal? Like why have the distinction in the first place? Because you try to be able to price things. Yes, that is that's precisely why we uh that's one of the reasons why we had that distinction. So you can you can come up with an equilibrium pricing strategy, right? So you make sure that you only include relevant things in your cost and in your price. But um, here's the assumption that I want you all to think more carefully about: is classification into product versus period is it irrelevant for operating income? Is it irrelevant for operating income? It is irrelevant to operating income. You're all absolutely sure about that, right? Question was, is the classification of a cost into product or period irrelevant as far as operating income? Or is the, is the op, isn't the operating income going to stay the same regardless of whether you treat any given cost item as product or period? As it turns out, no. Okay, it turns out no. Um, I haven't prepared an example for you, but I'm gonna try and make up an example on the fly, okay? So let's suppose You produce a thousand units of something and you sell those thousand units, okay, in the same period. Okay, so you start off with no inventory and you finish off with no inventory. Okay. So let's suppose your selling price per unit is ten. And let's suppose your manufacturing cost per unit is um How should we do this? Okay. Suppose the manufacturing cost per unit is four dollars. <coughs> okay, so your revenues are ten thousand. Your cost of goods sold are four thousand. Your gross margin is. 6,000, and then let's suppose you have some non-manufacturing overhead, of let's say 2,000, so that gives you a net income of 1,000, okay? Simple setup, you understand this. Okay, now suppose I want to do the following. Suppose I want to take, let's say, a thousand of my non-manufacturing overhead. This is being treated as a, what kind of cost now? As a period cost, right? Suppose I want to take a thousand out of this out of this non-manufacturing overhead, and I want to reclassify it as a, as a, as cost of goods sold or as a product cost. So what that means is that my total cost of goods sold is now going to be. 5,000, 
thousand, four thousand. So, you know, until now it seems like it doesn't matter. Operating income is going to be the same regardless of whether you classify something as a product cost or as a period cost. But now, let's change up this assumption a little bit. Let us suppose You produce 5,000, but you only sell 500. Okay? Suppose you produce 5,000, but you produce 1,000, but you only sell 500. So what does that mean? That you means you have some, some ending inventory on your books at the end of the year. So in the first scenario, your revenues continue to be, sorry, your revenues are now, what, 5,000? Your cost per unit is what, $4, right? So, 2,000. What are your non-manufacturing overheads? They continue to be 2,000, remember, because these are just expenses that are incurred in a particular period for various resources and you expense them in the period in which they are incurred. But now, let's suppose we decide to take this period cost and reclassify it as a product cost. So really, in this scenario, your cost per unit is four, and in the second scenario, your cost per unit is what? Five, right? So <clears throat> your revenues are now 5,000. Okay, what is your cost of goods sold? What is your cost of goods sold? Right? And then your non-manufacturing overhead is now a thousand. So what just ended up happening? Your operating income is now is now cut in half. So you recognize that it does matter to operating income whether you classify something as a product cost or a period cost. Can anyone tell me why? What is it that happened here in this example that is different from the first example that we looked at? <coughs> Anything that's included as a product cost gets expensed in what period? In the period in which the product is? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I knew there was, I knew I was making a mistake. It should be more, not less. <coughs> Thank you very much. Anything that's considered a product cost is expensed in what period? What is this word here? Cost of goods, what, made? Sold. So anything that's treated as a product cost is expensed in what period? The period in which the product is sold. Anything that's considered a period cost is expensed in what period? The period in which the cost is incurred. So suppose you make a whole bunch of products, but you don't sell all of them in the same period. All the product costs that go into making the products are not going to be entirely expensed in that same period. Do you see that? <coughs> so really, if you are coming up against a tight budget deadline, okay, and it looks like you're not going to make your income target for this year, what's an easy way to manufacture more income? What's an easy way to create more income? Just look at what happened here in this example. You produce more. What happens when you produce more? I mean, you can't decide actively to sell less. That's a function of how much demand there is, right? But if you simply you produce more relative to what you know you're going to sell, then what happens? You have more inventory and more of your product costs, instead of getting expensed as cost of goods sold, are going to be simply included in the cost of your ending inventory that's sitting on your balance sheet. 
okay so over producing at the end of the year when you know you're not going to be able to sell is a relatively quick and dirty way of simply manufacturing more income or creating more income okay because uh, you basically take all of the product costs that were put into the products that were made but not sold and you're able to take them up to the income statement for that period okay so it does matter whether you treat something as a product or as a period cost um so now that we finished that little discussion i want to go back to our activity based costing example okay yes sorry the cost per unit we decided was 4 so 4 times 500 2000 here the cost per unit is 5 so 5 times 500 2000 i did not get them from anywhere i just made them up okay all right so let's take a look at this at this question okay and let's apply these concepts of product and period cost in looking at that question okay so this is nevag's netball and they are a manufacturer of high quality basketballs and volleyballs they make kids fun set up costs are driven by the number of batches equipment and maintenance costs increase with the number of machine hours and lease rent is paid per square foot okay the capacity of the facility is 12000 square feet and nevag is currently using only 70% of this capacity okay so right now they have a facility with a 12000 square foot capacity and they're only using 70% of that capacity so let's mark off the capacity that's being used 70% of 12000 square feet is 8400 square feet okay yes i hope it's not about this yes uh when we when we mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, because there are many different your capacity is many different dimensions. Space is one dimension, machine capacity could be another dimension, people could be another dimension. You might need like a some kind of expert engineer to supervise the production and you can't hire more than let's say four, four engineers this period. So capacity can have many different dimensions. So you could use 100% along one dimension but less than 100% along another dimension. So you're only using 8400 square feet, okay? Now, Nevag, note the following line because it's the most important one. Record the cost of the unused capacity as a separate line item, not as a product cost, okay? Now, given the discussion we had, someone described to us what this means. Nevag records the cost of the unused capacity as a separate line item and not as a product cost. Yes, Marisa. That is correct. The income statement is going to be classified as a period cost. So, by definition, it's not going to be included in cost of goods sold. So that means you, as a managerial accountant, are not going to build the cost of the idle capacity into your unit cost estimates. Okay. So, below is the budgeted information for an EVAG. Um, this is a very straightforward setup. It's similar to what you saw before in the in the question which you guys did on your own. Some direct material costs, some direct labor costs. then set up equipment and lease rent those are the three indirect costs that you have here in this situation you've given a bunch of other information okay number of basketballs number of volleyballs the number of machine hours now what will you use this to do you will use the number of machine hours to allocate the equipment and maintenance costs because you are told that the equipment and maintenance costs are driven by machine hours you're also given the number of batches what will you use the number of batches to allocate the setup cost because you're told that the setup cost increase with the number of batches okay and i'm going to trust that you can do all of these allocations on your own because you practice enough you also have now square footage and what you will use square footage to allocate is the rent so now let's just talk for a moment about how you're going to deal with the rent so this is the basketball and these are the volleyballs okay so someone described to us exactly how the allocation of the rent will work so remember 
you are not allocating 100% of the rent, you are only going to distribute across the basketballs and the volleyballs what portion? The 70%. Okay, so 70% is what you're going to have to take and distribute across the basketballs and the volleyballs. So someone describe to us how exactly we go about doing this. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's 216,000. Okay. I would I would rather you actually use the numbers rather than describe it abstractly. So the total uh, rent that's being paid on the 12,000 square feet is 216,000. Okay. Okay. That's 8,400. Yes. Yes. So I think the amount that we pay by the export food is huge. So I guess how much we get to keep export food for the state. Okay. Something like small prices, right? The amount of food that we pay. Yes, so, yes, that's very good. Could you use the actual numbers, please? So, does everyone first understand what the total rent is that's going to be distributed across basketballs and volleyballs? What is it? The number, yes. 70%, right? So, that works out too. Can someone tell us what it is? Please. Two hundred. Okay. So, how do I split this one hundred and fifty-one thousand two hundred across the two? So that's the number that's got to be distributed across B, B, and B, B, right? So, how do I how do I split that? So you know, eighty-four hundred, and out of the eighty-four hundred, we know the following: three thousand three hundred and sixty. We're not finished yet. 3,360 for the basketball, and then 5,040 for the volleyball. So how do we apportion that 151,200? Aisha? Mm. That's right. The total square footage used is 8,400, right? Out of which the basketballs use 3,360, okay? So this proportion of 151,200 is what you allocate to the basketballs. And this proportion is what you allocate to the volleyballs, okay? What is the cost of the unused capacity here? So keep in mind, when you add up these two, they, they're going to add up to 100 and only to 151,000. What is the cost of the unused capacity here? It is the 216,000 times 30%. So whatever that number is, it's going to be approximately 64,000 something. Where will the cost of that ideal capacity appear on your income statement? It will appear as a period cost, after your cost of goods sold. But the key thing to keep in mind is that the cost that you estimate per basketball or the cost that you estimate per volleyball is going to exclude this 30%. Okay? Because if it were to include the cost of that idle capacity, we would effectively end up overpricing relative to what an equilibrium price would be. 